Good morning. Thank you for joining us on Get Connected. My name is Tricia Crane. I'm the Executive Director of the Alabama School Connection, which is a news website devoted to K-12 education in Alabama. Today, I am excited to have with us Gina Lowe, who is an attorney um, practicing exclusively in the field of special education. Um, Gina will tell us a little bit about why that is so unique, but first of all, let me just say thank you so much for being here, Gina. I appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's so much to talk about uh, in the field of special education. Um, we could talk for hours and hours. We're going to try <laughs> to limit it here to um, talking about um, uh, we'll hear a little bit about your practice and the group that you practice with and um, hopefully tell our viewers a bit about when it might be time to seek an attorney um, to help um, your child get the services that they need in school and you can share with us the, a little bit of the terminology about special education. Um, it gets confusing. It's very, you know, it's full of jargon, which is why we need attorneys, yeah. right? Um, you kind of lead us through all of this. And typically parents who are um, engaging in the special education journey, they really, it's usually their first journey, mm -hmm. and they just don't have the, the knowledge available to them. So we're going to start off. Gina, if you would, tell, tell us a little bit about um, how you came to the field of law and, you know, uh, and, ha and why, why special education law? What drew you there? Well, I've been an attorney um, for about 12 years, mm -hmm. and um, I, I worked with the prosecutor's office up in Cleveland, Ohio, rep you know, protecting the rights of children up there in a different way. Mm -hmm. It was through the Department of Human Resources um, trying to reunite um, children with their families. And when I moved to Alabama about three and a half years ago, it was brought to my attention through some of the contacts I had here that there was just such a need for, special, for attorneys in the special education field. Mm -hmm. um, there are only a handful of attorneys throughout the state of Alabama that, that practice special education, um, and it I was just really encouraged to get into that area. Mm -hmm. And so I started learning about it, um, doing some research, and um, met uh, Mr. James Gallini, who's my partner now. Um, right. But we met and started working together a little bit. Um, um, and then it grew into a partnership. And we're now partners with the Gallini Group. Mm -hmm. um, and we sp we're the only law firm in in Alabama that practices um, specialized or special education exclusively. Yes, and that is what makes you unique. Mm -hmm. um, I know, having been in the world of advocacy for, you know, a little over a decade uh, here in Alabama, that many of the families that I have met, uh, the, the struggles that they're having with school, it is in special education. And until attorneys started really focusing on special education, parents would be looking for a, a, what we call a plaintiff's attorney, you know, just yeah. someone who can file a suit. And the nuances of special education law, because it's a federal law, mm -hmm. uh, it's, um, it's unfamiliar to most attorneys. And so as a, as a person who's seen many families struggle, I'm glad that there are resources. Uh, I don't like to just, you know, send people off to attorneys. Uh, that's a, it's a very specific choice at a specific point in time. Exactly. But knowing that you're there is very, very helpful. Um, and, and we will provide contact information for Gina and for James. Uh, well, something our firm offers um, is that we do get we get phone calls every single day from parents. And we provide this as a, ser a free service to families throughout Alabama. It doesn't matter where you live. Um, we get calls every day just for advice. You know, what do I, what do, I do in this situation? You know, I'm confused about this. Um, you know, and we, most of the time we're able to give them a few pointers and they mm -hmm. walk off and they can handle it on their own. Wow. And we encourage them to do that as much as possible. Exactly. And it's only, it's the only the parents that we get that 
are seeking an attorney, usually it's after years of struggling to get what they believe their child needs, mm -hmm. and they've hit roadblocks, you know, mm -hmm. and they just feel like they have nowhere else to go, and that's generally when they're calling us to represent them. But if, if there's point. any way for them to handle it on their own with some advice from us, we, we try to encourage that. Um, that's great. So, so people can call your office, and it sort of depends on the situation, right? And there are other uh, agencies in the state that yeah. can help as well. And I know that you work with them, uh, the Alabama Disabilities Advocacy Program, yes. uh, or ADAP as we call it, and then the Alabama Parent, uh, oh, Parent Training Institute, I think mm -hmm. Alabama PTI in Wetumpka. It's a, it's a statewide organization, and they provide some uh, answers and you know counseling services for parents as well. Um, let me ask you, if you could, in you know, in in few words, you're really good at this. We've had this conversation <laughs> before about special education. What is special education in terms of? You know, uh, it's it, it specialized instruction. Is it a group of services? I mean, if you were, if you were going to explain this to folks who are very new to the world of special education, mm -hmm. how would you tell us? Well, you know, that's something we're working on too because it's so huge mm -hmm. and it's so overwhelming. You know, as an attorney, um, as a parent, as you know, anyone trying to advocate for children's rights in the education realm. It's just overwhelming the amount of information out there. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we are trying to do, and we're doing it a little bit at a time, is we're creating resources for parents um, through different websites and through our own website. We have a blog. You know, mm -hmm. when we have some interesting topic come up, uh, we're posting information on our blog about, you know, how parents can handle this. For instance, um, I did one recently where we had a lot of parents calling saying, I want this for my child, but the school says they don't have money for it. Mm -hmm. um, so we posted on our blog what, you know, what you can do in that situation if the school is saying they don't have money for certain mm -hmm. services, sort of what parents can do. So we try to we try to keep you know the the pulse, and if we see that there's a hot topic out there to, to talk about it a mm -hmm. little bit on our website, and also um, we created a brochure that's you know so parents can understand their rights a little bit more. We're Wonderful. we're doing talks all over the state um, to help educate parents. We have a Facebook page where you know anything new and upcoming we're post, and it's so quick just to post it mm -hmm. on there and share it with mm -hmm. families. But um, the bottom line is that if your child has a disability, um, all children with disabilities, it doesn't matter what the disability um, is entitled to a free and appropriate public education. Okay. And now we sometimes call that FAPE. FAPE, right? exactly. Okay. F-A-P-E. Um, you'll hear that a lot. And that's, you know, that's something that parents should really focus on in their day-to-day de -day dealings mm -hmm. with schools is that I want my child to have you know, a free and appropriate education, public education. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that doesn't mean the best education. Mm -hmm. um, it's appropriate. And right. a lot of fights, a lot of the time when we get phone calls from parents is because there's a disagreement about what appropriate means. Mm. You know, a parent might think it's here and a school might think it's down here somewhere. Mm -hmm you know, and finding that middle ground so that, I mean, maybe neither side is getting 100% what they want, but you're meeting in the middle where, you know, we believe the child's getting what, you know, their, what their individualized needs may be in the school setting. Um, and then you have two huge bodies of law that govern education um, for children with disabilities. You have the Americans with Disabilities Act, mm -hmm. and which is um, which works in tandem with Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. So they complement one another. Right. And then you have the second body of law, which is the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act. And that's where that was that was a whole lot of information. So we're going to hang on to that thought. We're okay. going to take a break. We're going to come back in our next segment. Gina's going to expound on that a little bit uh, about 
the differences in the two, and maybe talk about some interesting cases. There have been a couple of um, cases and some, some common problems that have been addressed recently, mm -hmm. so please stay tuned. Welcome back. Um, today we're talking to Gina Lowe. Uh, about uh, special education. Um, Gina is a practicing attorney in this area and we were talking about how very few attorneys really have the expertise in special education law. So I appreciate your taking the time today to talk with us. I know you're very busy. Um, when, we, when we cut away for the break, we were talking, we were just getting started on uh, Section 504 and the IDEA. And, you know, we don't want to get too technical, but there are differences in um, how uh, a child's disability may be identified uh, so that and what kinds of services or accommodations mm -hmm. kick in at school. We're always talking about at school on Get Connected. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about maybe um, Section 504? Sure. Okay. Um, Section 504 is incredibly broad, so it's, it's pretty easy if you have a disability, and it doesn't matter what type of disability, it's either a mental or physical disability that substantially limits you in some life activity, mm -hmm. and the code is incredibly broad that almost anything is a major life activity, breathing, walking, okay. seeing, um, concentrating, learning, speaking, you know, pretty much anybody can qualify if you have a disability under Section 504. Okay. Um, and the way to qualify for a Section 504 plan, and a Section 504 plan is an accommodation plan where um, you're, because of your disability, you're not, you don't have equal access to an education, um, but there are accommodations that can be put into place to allow you to have access to an education. So okay. for instance, mm -hmm. if you have a vision problem, you know, it may be something as simple as moving your desk closer to the front. Okay. Um, if you have a concentration problem, it might be, you know, taking your test um, out of the main room, you know, so, or if you, if you're not quick at writing, you know, maybe you'll have a note taker that okay. can help you. And 504 plans are really designed for children who just need pretty minor accommodations in order to access the curriculum. Okay. Um, IDEA, on the other hand, um, is more limited in who's covered. Okay. So it's not enough just to have a disability. It has to be one of the uh, delineated disabilities. There's 13 right. different um, categories of disability. So first you have to check to make sure that the disability is in one of those categories. That's the first step. Okay. The second step is does the disability impair your ability to learn? Mm -hmm. And the, the word that they use is does it impact your ability, does it impair your educational performance. Okay. And a lot of parents get confused by that terminology because they think it means academics. And so they believe if my child's getting A's and B's that they're not going to be able to get it. So under the IDEA, um, the, the, the main concept of IDEA is the IEP. It's an individualized education plan. Right. And it outlines, I'm sorry for jumping around, but it outlines yeah. the things that an IEP team that comes together has decided the child needs in order to bridge that gap between um, their whatever's hindering their ability to learn, you know, giving them that so that they can learn exactly. on par with their typical peers. Right. Um, We've talked about the IEP, uh, the, the IEP itself as kind of a contract between yes. the schools and the, uh, the school officials and the parents and the child to mm -hmm. say, this is what my child needs, um, this is what our child needs to um, be able to learn at a free and appropriate level, right? Yes. Uh, and so in the IEP team, we've talked about this a little, and that is the group of people who are crafting the mm -hmm. contract, right? And it's typically a lot of school officials, uh, also maybe your professionals that um, uh, maybe a doctor or a psychiatrist or an occupational therapist or a, 
you know, these are all the people that are working together mm -hmm. to make sure that the contract contains the information that, and everybody knows what to expect. You exactly. know, it really just, when it's written down, then, you know, nobody gets confused, hopefully. Uh, sometimes they do, and then they reach out to you. Right. Um, but so just to, just, I, I just want parents to know that just because your child is getting fairly good grades, A, Bs, and Cs, doesn't mean your child's not eligible for an IEP because educational performance encompasses um, academics, communication, and socialization. So, okay. so even though a child is academically um, doing well, that doesn't mean that necessarily they do not qualify for an IEP. That is a very important concept mm -hmm. because I have spoken with parents, and I'm sure you have, who say, well, the school told me that until my child fails, right. they're not eligible for special education services. And what I'm hearing you say is that that may or may not be true, right? It's, well, it's not true. Uh, it, you don't have to wait for a child to fail. But a child who is failing in some area uh, of academics, it's worth taking a look. I want to I switch here just a little bit and talk about if you suspect your child has a disability, let's say your child is struggling. Mm -hmm. um, to concentrate on their homework at night, or they can't get their homework finished, or uh, there may be some behavior problems in school that you keep getting notes home from the teacher, or um, there are um, it, there are points in a, in, a, in a child's educational life where you may question whether or not there's something more going on than just typical child things. Mm -hmm. And so what's the best way for parents to begin that conversation with, you know, who do you start with? You start with the child's teacher um, to say, hey, you know, I don't understand why uh, my son is getting in trouble every day. I keep getting these notes home. Um, I, I mean, we always say start with the teacher. Mm -hmm. But if the teacher, you know, the, the, I think a really tough place for parents to be is we don't want to go over teachers' heads. We don't want to, climbing that ladder uh, and pushing back a little bit can be really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But we need to do it. Um, you know, if we don't do it and there is something going on, then who will do that? Right. So if you, let's say you've talked with it, what are the, what, what are you asking for? I mean, what are you, what are you really saying? Can you help me figure out what's going on with my child? You know? Well, you know, it's very individualized um, in terms of when a parent would reach out for that specialized help. Okay. Um, it's going to, you know, it's a very personalized decision because some children it might be something as simple you know bringing it to the teacher's attention and that teacher providing a little bit more one-on-one -on -one. Mm -hmm. and for a lot of children that's all all it takes to to get the child to have equal access in the classroom exactly but for other children if you really believe you know that your child needs more than just something some simple accommodation in the classroom and you believe that your child has a learning disability or a social disability or um, attention, you know, whatever it might be, and you think it's going to require more in order for your child to, you know, to benefit from the classroom, then you can make what's called a referral for special, for special education. Anybody can make a referral. It doesn't have to be a parent, a okay. teacher, a counselor, a physician. You know, anybody can contact the school, and generally you contact the special ed, spe, special education coordinator. Each school okay. has one. Each school district has one. Um, and you contact them and just say, you know, we, we always tell parents anything you do, do it in writing. That's what I was going to say. Just because if yeah. you say it, it didn't happen. Um, right. So we, we, we say always put it into writing. But and. Just put something in writing that says, I would like my child evaluated for special education services. Okay. And then the ball's in the school's court. Okay. The school um, comes together they, as a team to decide whether or not to proceed with the referral. Okay. Um, if they don't agree with you, um, they might say, well, we're not going to evaluate for special education. That doesn't usually happen. Usually schools will say, okay, well, let's take a look at it. You know, let's get our psychometrist involved. Let's do some testing. Let's do some evaluations. Let's talk to the teachers. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then once they have all their information, including information that the parent might have from private providers, then a team comes together, an eligibility team, and decides whether the child qualifies for special education. And if the child does qualify, then an IEP is, is developed. Okay. I want hold that thought because mm -hmm. there's more to that thought. Um, uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Gina's going to talk a little bit more about how we get through this process and also um, when it might be time to hire an attorney okay. uh, or seek out the assistance of an attorney. Like you said, it can come in all forms. So please stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Um, this is Get Connected. We're talking with Gina Lowe, uh, a, an, a, an attorney who practices in the area of special education in Alabama. Um, Gina has been sharing with us some of the um, the world of special education from an attorney's perspective of what should be done in what kind of order. Um, right before the break, we were talking about if you believe that your child, um, there's some struggles going on in school mm -hmm. and you have requested a referral for a special education evaluation, um, you know, uh, the school will take steps. They will determine whether or not they're going to move forward with the evaluation for special education. You mentioned that typically um, schools, school officials will go along with that and they will say, you know what, let's do see if, if there's mm -hmm. some needs here that could be best served in special education. Um, sometimes they're not and then you're kind of back to the drawing board. But let's say that you get into special, you, your child um, is approved for special education services basically, right? You get this IEP, Individualized Education Plan, that delineates Okay, these are. This is my child's disability. This is where we're going to go. Uh, this is the type of progress that we expect. Mm -hmm. um, you you touch base when a child has an IEP. You touch base in your IEP meetings that are held no less than once a year, but can be called whenever the parent has concerns. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you run into glitches along the way. One of the things we were talking about during the break was the idea that um, if your child is not making the progress uh, that you think your child should be making, you know, there are going to be some goals mm -hmm. on this IEP, and, but then you realize that your child is really not making progress towards those goals. You know, parents who are going through this for the first time don't really know how hard to push right? Uh, some parents sit back and school officials trust and, you know, yeah. they, they, okay, we're going to make progress next year. But really, I've, I've heard you say, you know, you really kind of have to stay on top of this um, and parents need to be equipped. What can you, what can you, how do parents get equipped? How do they find that nerve to say, I've really got to question this? Do you have any thoughts on that? And now are you referring to if if they just feel like things aren't going right? Yes, or how yes. to because I, I think you could start out by saying to a parent, you know, these are the things you can do to protect yourself, to protect your child, to make sure your child's getting what he or she needs. Um, right. And there, there are a few very simple premises to that okay. um, that we really fight hard for. And one is that documentation. You know, that you're documenting yes. everything. You're keeping copies. If the school gives you something and they want it back, take a copy of it. Okay. Um, the other thing is that um, you it's not enough to have goals. The goals okay. are the centerpiece of an IEP. Um, you mm -hmm. want to look at your child's individualized needs and create goals based on those needs. Now, something that we find that Alabama schools really have a hard time with um, are creating goals that are measurable. Okay. If your goal's not measurable, there's no way to act, to act to determine if a child's made progress or not. Okay. Um, so you need numbers in there that can give you a baseline where your child's starting out mm -hmm. and where we want our child to be at the end of the year. You okay. need numbers. Um, and it has to be objectively measurable because if it's something like, for instance, um, the child will behave appropriately, you know, each of us, that's a subjective goal because each person in their mind has their own idea of what appropriately means. 
So you may need to make sure that these goals are objectively measurable, that okay. each of us, when we look at it, we know what we're measuring. Um, but the most important thing is that somebody's taking data points along the way, looking at progress. You're not waiting till the end of the year to see if a child's made progress. You're taking, collecting data, and it could be something, it just a minute, like for instance, if you have a child who um, has problems reading, okay. and they start out reading you know, 10 words per minute, and by the end of the year, you want them to be reading 50 words per minute. Okay. You know, every couple of weeks, do a timed, you know, one minute timed reading test, you know, and you create a chart and you can look at it to see, is he making progress? Is he not making progress? If he's making progress, is he on target to hit his goal by the end of the year? And if not, what do we need? It could be very simple changes to the, to the plan, make, moving the child to a different environment. You know, um, well, let me ask you this, because when you say to do this test, are you referring to school officials doing the test or is this something parents can do at home? I mean, oftentimes there are ways, you know, to, you can't just always leave it in the school officials' hands, right? I mean, we need to be actively involved in, in mm -hmm. what it is our children are learning. But when you're, you're really talking about that school officials should be putting in place these um, periodic measures. Yes to make sure that you're making, your child is making progress towards the goal. Now we have parents who do testing at home hmm. and a lot of time there's a discrepancy between hmm. what the school is seeing and what the parents are seeing at home. So we really want to make sure that these tests, the testing is being done in the school setting okay. and it's being done under conditions that are reliable um, because, for instance, you can't judge whether a child made progress based on grades because right. grades are very subjective right. and it doesn't take into account potential accommodations that are being offered, okay. things like that. So you need to make sure that it's a reliable ass assay, whatever you know, um, you're using, um, and that the parents on board with how it's being conducted. Okay. Now, if you if you still don't quite believe that the school is doing the right type of testing and you don't feel absolutely comfortable with, it's always appropriate to have some of the outside professionals that are working with your child perform some testing, okay. because then that person you know will create a packet that you can take to your IEP meeting. You can invite that person to participate in some way, even by conference call for a few minutes, you know. And so there's ways to really set up a system so that everyone can trust the results um, right. and that they're accurate. Well, and you mentioned the word trust, mm -hmm. and, and that is so important. And so oftentimes um, these situations get very emotional. I mean, these mm -hmm. are our children, and we when things are not going well and we don't feel that maybe school officials are taking it as seriously as we would like, we tend to get emotional. Yeah. And that's why um, sometimes that can escalate a situation. You know, you, you start building those hard feelings. I know that you, you know, uh, we don't want those hard feelings. Mm -hmm. those, are, those are difficult situations to then remedy. Mm -hmm. uh, they escalate very quickly, I guess, is what I'm, I'm thinking. So. When we get to the, this point where maybe we're not communicating well with school officials and there's disagreement, uh, you know, and I, I wrinkle up my face because it's a little uncomfortable, right? And parents are unhappy, school officials are unhappy, that's when they contact you, typically, uh, you or James. It, it's, it, what you hope is that parents are getting good advice all along the way. Mm -hmm. And that's why, again, uh, we're gonna share the information about how folks can get in contact with you and James, but also the, um, the website where you have a lot of this educational information. So, but, but if, a, I mean, sometimes we hear from school officials, oh, don't call an attorney, that'll just slow everything down. Mm -hmm. We'll work this out. And, Sometimes you can contact an attorney and it doesn't have to be an adversarial thing when mm -hmm. you bring an attorney to the table. I know that's something that y'all work for. You work to, to resolve the problem. What can a parent expect when they contact your office? Uh, say I'm, I call and I say, Miss Lowe, I, you know, I've been working with my school district for eight, two years and we're not getting anywhere. What will they receive on the other end of the phone from you? Well, you know, for the majority of clients um, that call up, or potential clients that call us, 
the majority of parents that call, we really assess the situation. We give a very detailed um, phone call or meeting to determine what the issues are. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time, it's a very simple fix, you know, getting the right, this is something that we run into a lot where the school is trying to service a child, but but there haven't been any evaluations done in six mm -hmm. years. You know, so sometimes it's something as simple as getting some updated evaluations, getting the right professionals involved, having those professionals be an advocate for families because okay. they, the right professionals that you trust and that work well with your family can be a parent's biggest advocate. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a big recommendation that we provide. But if the parents have just, they've been trying for years to get services and they feel like they've hit a roadblock and they're not getting anywhere, and we assess the case and, and, and realize that there's a legitimate controversy, mm -hmm. um, then we get involved. And there's the IDEA provides that if a parent has a, you know, like I said, a legitimate dispute with a school system, and they fight it and they prevail at the end of the day, which means they were right, mm -hmm. um, that they can be reimbursed for their attorney fees. And that's okay. a big protection because the people who designed the IDEA realized that a lot of parents just don't have the money. You right. know, the school has all this money and resources, but parents don't oftentimes. So this was really inserted as a protection for parents who might not otherwise be able to afford legal services. Wow, uh, that is, you know, you hope you never get to that point, mm -hmm. but it's good to know that you're out there. And there are other attorneys, you know, I should say this is, um, I hope none of what we've discussed is legal advice. It's more of just this conversation about how, uh, how to approach special education, mm -hmm. what you need to be looking out for. So I really appreciate you being with us today. Gina, we could talk for hours. We well, have, uh, we, there are so many areas that are interesting and there's so much information we didn't get to here on my little card. <laughs> but uh, thanks again for being with us today. And you will find Gina's contact information will be on the screen. And uh, I appreciate you being here and thank you for watching.